the Jesuit School Network's inaugural Ignatian Inquiry After School Virtual Symposium. I am Kristen Ross Cully, and I serve as Director of Inquiry and New Ventures with the JSN's Conference Office team. This is my 23rd year in Jesuit education, and prior to the JSN, I was principal of Loyola School in New York City, assistant principal of Regis High School, also in New York, and a teacher and counselor and department chair along the way. I have been studying and learning about and researching women in our schools for over 12 years now. And I am thrilled to moderate what I know will be an informative and an inspiring conversation on the meaningful experiences and impact of women in our schools at this particular moment in time. My career in Jesuit education has shaped who I am as a person and as a professional. And it is my great privilege to lead this symposium on the power of women in Jesuit education. Please know that this session is being recorded and I would like to thank my colleague on the Jesuit conference communication team, Meg Ann Leach, uh, for her assistance today with all things Zoom. This is the first large virtual event that we are undertaking across the network, a pilot experience for us, so to speak. So we're learning as we go, and I know that you can all appreciate that. I would ask you as we begin, just to be sure that your microphones are muted for the duration of our program. Uh, we will be spotlighting the speakers as we go, and I might suggest that you use the speaker view as well on your own uh, laptop, just to make sure that that works. Uh, as, we, uh, as we get into the program, uh, you can feel free to send questions and comments within the chat uh, feature, and we'll do our best to keep track of that and hold on to them for the Q&A portion at the end. So let's begin with some context. Women serve and lead in every facet of our JSN school communities, from the first year teacher navigating her way around her new school, to the office manager leading the main office, from the seasoned president who has led her school for many years to the service director, shepherding her students' commitments to community organizations, from the finance office to the English department, and every staff, faculty, and administrative role in between. Each position is crucial to the life and the health of the school. Historically, Jesuit schools have, as a whole have been predominantly male organizations, remembering that for much of their histories in many schools, Jesuit institutions were staffed mostly by Jesuit priests and brothers. The first women did not start working in many of our schools until the late 60s or early 70s. Every day in today's world, in ways too numerous to mention, the women in our communities are making tremendous contributions to enlivening and embodying the mission of our schools. As of today, April 4th, 2022, all of us have lived through over two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, navigating in real time the many resulting disruptions to our lives. To include, but not limited to, concerns over our health and the health of our family members, child care disruptions and elder care disruptions. Some have experienced job loss within families. We have all experienced instability of family routines, isolation, vaccine access or lack thereof for our youngest children, and constantly changing work and home lives as we have all balanced quarantines and the many ripple effects of the times in which we presently live. Of course, we're all hopeful that this is beginning to come to an end, but we're not there yet. And there is much to unpack from the time of which we are emerging. The conversation that we will have this afternoon is an effort to dig into this particular moment with the lens of gender, focusing on the realities of professional women in a pandemic world. If you think about it, the pandemic has in so many ways exposed to us what has always been there, but what we have been too busy to see. Just consider the inequities of the educational system across the globe that have been brought to light since March of 2020. 
So let's consider how has the pandemic affected the lives of women in our schools? How has it unearthed the power of women in Jesuit education that has always been there and brought to light all that we balance every day? In a supportive and informative conversation with Ignatian colleagues, we are bringing together female educators from in and around the JSN to reflect on their experience and celebrate their impact. Before we begin, let's open our symposium as we always do with a prayer. If we can quiet ourselves and please be reminded that in being together this afternoon, even virtually, we are in the presence of God. So in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Let's pray in particular for all those that are struggling in our world today, struggling with health and isolation, and most especially those immersed in war and conflict. Gracious God, we pray for ourselves and all women as leaders. Give us and them open hearts and opportunities to serve. Give us and them listening hearts so that your words flow through us as we talk, teach, serve, and lead. Give us and them the courage to step outside of our plans and programs if you have another path for us to take, as well as the discipline to stay on course amid distraction and interruption. We pray for the capacity to welcome all people with love and warmth. Give us and them patience, endurance, and fortitude. Keep us and them healthy, rested, and full of joy from beginning to end. We ask this as we ask all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. As you know, the JSN seeks to be a supportive resource to our schools, and this virtual symposium is designed to be just that. To learn, to be curious, and engage with colleagues across North America. We are eager to encourage a spirit of inquiry across the many layers of our work in Jesuit education, and we envision our particular brand of Ignatian inquiry to be the art of inquiry as seen through our Ignatian lens, asking questions and exploring issues that matter in our schools through the frame of our shared Jesuit mission. We have just over two hours together this afternoon, and at the conclusion, the recorded session will be shared widely via our website and our various social media platforms. If you are joining us live after school on this Monday afternoon or watching the recorded session later on your own, we thank you for taking the time to be here. Your presence and interest in this symposium is testament to the fact that we are leading here an important and timely conversation to the health of our schools and the well-being of the educators in them. The content here is sure to be relevant to both women and men, hailing from all roles in our schools and all contexts and settings. We've actually heard that there are groups of women gathered together in some schools watching the symposium together, and we really think this is awesome. So thank you all for being here. In building our panel of presenters, we imagine that the content of our time together will serve to inform, to affirm, to transform, perhaps to challenge, and also inspire each of us as we navigate the unusual times we find ourselves in. Our speakers will share about recent research on American parents' lived experiences during the pandemic, about the invisible labor of women in education, about an essential and perhaps new to us, Ignatian virtue for women working in our schools, and finally, insights on how we, as professional women, may support each other and help each of us to reach our place of most potential. It's sure to be a packed and informative uh, afternoon together. We aim to share experiences and learning that may serve to make you feel connected to the other women across the JSN, 
that may serve to make you feel as if your experience these past few years has resonated with others, that may offer language and meaning that helps to articulate our collective experience, ultimately serving to open all of our eyes to the incredible impact of women in Jesuit education every day, and most especially in these days in which we live. With this context in mind, let's get into this afternoon's program. We welcome six panelists who will share their work and insights as female educators and researchers who have leaned in to various dimensions of the experience of professional women in a pandemic world. The gift of the virtual stage means that our panelists join us from Milwaukee, Palo Alto, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, San Jose, and Denver. How great is that? We will benefit from the experiences of women working at Marquette University, Stanford University, Xavier University, Regis Jesuit High School, Sacred Heart Nativity School, and the Midwest Province PACE Office. And also note that our participants in this symposium, all of you who have joined this Zoom call, hail from every corner of every province across North America. Our program this afternoon allows for our six speakers to each share for about 10 to 20 minutes each. And two of them are fellow Ignatian educators who will offer real-time reflections on the remarks of the panelists that come before them. I'll be the moderator among us and be sure to offer full introductions to each speaker as we go. We'll save room for a question and answer period. Uh, so remember, please use the chat uh, feature as the speakers are presenting. Uh, we'll save room for that Q&A period at the conclusion of the remarks, and we will aim to end promptly as planned at 5.15 p.m. Eastern. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce uh, properly our first uh, panelist. Dr. Estrita Kogers is an Associate Professor of Psychology, Assistant Chair, Department of Psychology, Director of Honors in the Psychology Program and Family Studies minor at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She received her undergraduate degree in psychology from Stanford University and her master's and doctoral degrees from Case Western Reserve University. After a year-long pre-doctoral clinical internship at the Children's Hospital in Denver, she completed her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center and National Jewish Health. Dr. Kogers teaches both undergraduate and graduate courses. Her research program addresses two areas of interest, child and family adjustment, to children's chronic illness and socio-emotional processes in children and families. Her session title this afternoon is Examining the Impact of Pand the Pandemic on Families, a conversation on the Marquette University research study, Exploring American Parents' Lived Experiences During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Ramifications for Well-Being. Dr. Covers. Here we go. All right. Thank you, Kristen, um, for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, as we know, these opportunities for virtual connection are one of the advantages now that we have post, well, as we hopefully enter the end of the pandemic. So um, thank you for this invitation. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the contributions. Let me just make sure. There we go. All right. Let me begin by acknowledging the contributions of my colleagues, um, Dr. Deborah Oswald, Dr. Lindsay Holly, Mary Tate, and the participants of our study. Uh, Dr. Oswald was really um, instrumental in inviting me and motivating me to 
conduct this study. We were both um, working mothers, still are working mothers. And two years ago, we were wondering what can we do to help document this time in history to better understand the implications for children and families. And so the study that I'll be describing today is one of the papers that we've published. Um, and at the end, I will share one of our next upcoming projects as well. So as we know, the spring of 2020 brought dramatic shifts in the lives of American families as they needed to negotiate changes in many different domains. Kristen already highlighted some of those challenges. They included changes in employment, job furloughs, unemployment, and transitions to working from home, increases in household chores and job responsibilities, changes in social relationships as we needed to find different ways of interacting and giving and receiving social support when our accustomed ways of interacting personally were no longer possible, changes to our children's education as schools and childcare centers closed and these responsibilities fell to caregivers. And finally, changes in terms of our well-being as we faced fears about physical health and safety and needed to manage increasing levels of stress. Moreover, families varied in the ways and extent to which the COVID-19 pandemic impacted their lives. Research confirms that caregiver well-being impacts other family members, such as children and spouses, as well as overall family functioning. And further, it seemed that women were experiencing a disproportionate burden of stress during the pandemic due to circumstances surrounding employment and their primary responsibilities for household labor and childcare responsibilities. So we developed this study to answer this larger question to better understand how aspects of family management were associated with parent well being in these early months of the pandemic. So we identified four different domains of family management that we were interested in examining. The first was understanding the different ways that COVID-19 was impacting families, both in the experiences that they had, as well as the impacts in, in their functioning. Next, we were interested in understanding how changes in household responsibility contributed to parent well being. Further, we were curious about how work life conflict um, contributed. And finally, we wanted to better understand how this unique responsibility of parent assisted learning was affecting parents. So we were curious about how these different aspects of family management impacted parent well-being. So specifically, parents' sense of feeling overloaded in their, care, in their parenting responsibilities, symptoms of anxiety, and symptoms of depression. The data was collected online um, during May and June of 2020. The participants, um, we invited participants that were 18 years of age or older. They needed to reside in a US state or US territory. They needed to be fluent in English as all of the survey measures were in English. And for these analyses, we were interested in parents who had a child um, 18 years of age or younger. So out of the 942 participants that completed the survey, a little more than half had a child, um, at least one child living with them that was 18 years of age or older. And so these were the parents that were included in the analyses that I'll be describing today. Um, here you can see the racial ethnic composition of the parents, um, predominantly white, but also representing Black, Asian American, Latinx, Native American, and self-described other races and ethnicities. We had slightly more mothers than fathers participating in this study. 
Um, and we were really happy to have this almost equal representation of mothers and fathers responding. The average age of participating parents was 37 years, and the majority of families had two children. Most of the participants had a bachelor's or advanced degree, and they resided in all of the United States and the territories. Next, I'll describe um, the ver various measures that we'll be using. But actually, let me go back a second. Um, we solicited participants from a variety of different recruitment sources. So we had some participants who completed the survey um, via US Mechanical Turk, which is a opportunity for individuals to complete surveys for payment. And we also advertised the survey through a variety of different sources. So we had university announcements, social media advertisements. We um, posted the study on a website that was soliciting participants for research studies from around the world. And we used word of mouth um, to share the invitation to participate in the survey. And thanks to kind of all of these methods, we were able to um, recruit participants that had these um, demographic characteristics that you see listed here. So now I'll describe some of the, the measures that we included. So one, the first measure um, just asked families to describe whether or not they had experienced 25 different COVID-19 related events. And then we had nine questions asking parents to rate how much the pandemic affected different aspects of their lives. So for example, how family members got along and how the pandemic was affecting physical and emotional well-being. We had one question that asked participants um, to consider compared to their experiences before the COVID-19 pandemic, were they doing more or less work around the home than before? We had 10 questions that asked parents about work-life conflict. Um, you can see that about 93% of the sample um, had individuals, were individuals who were employed. And so we asked the work-life conflict of the participants who were employed. And these were 10 items that asked whether and how different demands of work and family created strain or conflict. Among the parents, 77% um, had children whose schools had closed and learning had transitioned online. And so we, these parents answered questions about their experiences of supporting children's learning, how competent they felt in supporting their learning, um, whether they felt like they had enough resources to support their children's learning and the stress they may have been experiencing due to needing to support their children's learning. This was an interesting construct to assess because we really hadn't experienced this large scale phenomena where parents were responsible for their children's learning at home. And the circumstances of homeschooling were certainly very different than circumstances that we all encountered during um, virtual school. We had seven items that asked about the degree to which parents felt overloaded by their caregiving role. Then we had seven items from a widely used questionnaire that asked about symptom, symptoms of anxiety and almost half of the participants reported experiencing clinically significant symptoms of anxiety. Finally, we had nine items that assess symptoms of depression and slightly more than half of the participants reported clinically significant symptoms of depression. Both of these um, percentages are higher than um, the levels that were reported prior to the pandemic. So now I'd like to share um, some different results from um, what we learned about the family's experiences of COVID-19 related events, and then some answers to some of our different questions about those relationships that we were exploring. 
So almost all of the parents reported experiencing at least two types of COVID-19 related events. And so this was from that checklist where they had to indicate whether or not they had experienced that event. And half of the sample had experienced at least 10 different types of COVID-19 related events. The most frequently endorsed events were having a stay at home order, having their child school or child care center close, and being unable to visit or care for a family member. So the next I'd like to share some results about what we found in examining the relationships between these different family management responsibilities or domains and parenting role overload. In addition to the questionnaires that I described on a previous slide, we also asked participants to tell us about um, some different demographic characteristics, and you'll see how those were included in the analyses. So first, we were interested in what predicted greater parenting role overload. We found that families with less income and younger parent age reported greater parenting role overload. Interestingly, higher parent education was associated with a greater sense of parenting role overload. And perhaps this may have been related to um, the types of jobs that were related to a higher parent education and the associated stress of managing work and family responsibilities. Parents who perceived greater increases in managing household labor reported greater strain in their parenting role. And those parents who reported more COVID exposures and more COVID impacts reported greater parenting role overload strain. Then we did some analyses specifically looking at the parents that were working and those that were supporting their children's learning at home. So among the parents that were working, we saw some of these same characteristics to be predictive of greater parenting role overload. So less family income, higher parent education, and then we saw that being a mother um, was a predictor so that women were more likely to report greater parenting role overload if they were also working. Similarly, more COVID-19 exposures and COVID-19 impacts were related to greater parenting role overload and greater work-life conflict um, was associated with greater strain on parenting. Among the parents that supported their children's learning at home, we saw these same three demographic characteristics as predictors. Also more perceived increase in household labor and COVID exposures and impacts were related to greater sense of parenting role overload. And then two of our dimensions of supporting children's learning was associated with greater parenting role overload. The first was that parents who had a greater sense of self-efficacy or more self-confidence in supporting their children's learning experienced greater parenting role overload. Perhaps they, um, these were parents that were feeling a greater sense of responsibility um, for supporting their children in their learning. Similarly, those parents that experienced more stress, reported more stress about supporting their children's learning, they also um, were more likely to report more, a greater sense of feeling overwhelmed and overloaded by the parenting role. Next, we examine how these same dimensions of family management and demographic characteristics um, were related to parent anxiety and depression. So specifically related to anxiety, we saw that lower family income and younger parent age um, were associated with greater anxiety among parents and more COVID exposures and impacts. 
and also parents who had a greater, felt more overwhelmed and overloaded by their parenting role were also experiencing more anxiety. Very similar results for, for depression among parents with the addition of um, mothers being at increased risk for experiencing clinically significant symptoms of depression. And then those similar predictors of COVID exposures and impacts and a sense of parental role overload. So as we think about these results almost two years later, um, I think it's important to reflect on of how these results can inform our understanding of what has happened in the last two years. Um, for those of you familiar with work in academia, it takes a long time to get research conducted and published. And so um, that's why we're still now seeing results from that are emerging to help us understand these early months of the pandemic. But we had strong evidence that there was a significant and a negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on parents. And we can expect that that impacted their family functioning and their children, although we didn't specifically assess that in this study. Um, we have evidence that parents felt overloaded um, with their responsibilities, anxious and depressed. So for some families, these difficulties that they experienced early in the uh, pandemic, those may have resolved. For other families, those difficulties may have intensified. And that's where we're gonna look to even more research to come to help us better understand kind of these different trajectories that caregivers and families have experienced the last two years. But we do know that there is a youth mental health crisis, as was highlighted by the US Surgeon General um, in late 2021. And as I know that schools are experiencing, especially this year, as students have returned um, to in-person learning. So we know that this will require continued support for parents and children to help them address the stress or the trauma that they may have experienced um, throughout the pandemic and helping them develop those coping resources that can continue to support them in this time of transition. We also need policies and programs to assist and support parents from the individual level of schools and communities to larger um, state and federal supports, as well as supports in different types of organizations. And as we think about our school communities, I think it's essential that we think about how to continue to support staff um, and how to continue to support parents of students um, who are like the parents that participated in the present study. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions um, towards the end of the session. Thank you, Estrita. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I'm certain that much of the research uh, that you have shared has served as affirmation to the experiences of many of the women uh, on our call, and I look forward to having a chance to, to talk about it. I'm thinking about uh, what you shared about women uh, being more likely to share a greater uh, sense of parent overload, parent parental role overload, um, also to the aspect of higher education, uh, parents' higher education and how that affects that sense of, of role overload. Um, and then absolutely the idea of parent supported or parent assisted learning for their own children and how that contributes to that sense of overload as well. And again, hearing that through the lens of, of teachers and educators around our school who are also assisting uh, the education of the students in their care, uh, there's certainly a lot to think about. So thank you for that.
We'll move now to our next speaker and we'll work to get our spotlights correct here. If Meg can spotlight uh, Melissa, I will give a proper introduction here. Our next panelist, Melissa V. Abad, PhD, is a research scholar at the Stanford VMware Women's Leadership Innovation Lab and leads the Intersectional Leadership Research Agenda. Her research examines the occupational trajectories of women of color in elite organizations and the resources that help their leadership development. Dr. Abad's scholarly research lies at the intersection of organizational sociology and intersectionality. Current projects include identifying the strategies women of color employ to advance their careers, how these differ by racial and ethnic groups, and assessing the strengths and weaknesses of diversity programming. She's given talks and workshops on intersectionality, diversity management, and women of color leadership. A Chicago native, she is a product of Catholic education. She received her doctorate in sociology at the University of Illinois at Chicago, a master's from the University of Chicago, and an undergraduate degree from Northwestern University. Today, Dr. Abad will explore how the challenges of women in the workplace persist in the 21st century. The pandemic has not only exposed how some of these challenges persist, but has in some cases made them worse as women employees manage family responsibilities, navigate Zoom fatigue as their workplaces deal with cycles of shutdown and partial reopening. Teachers have faced a complex burden as they navigate school responses, their students' needs, and their own. Her presentation entitled Making Visible the Invisible Labor of Women in Education will provide language to describe some of these challenges to help lay women teachers make sense of their journey and empower them as they navigate Jesuit schools. Dr. Abad. Thank you for the warm introduction and it's really a pleasure to be here with um, with this network in large part because um, I feel like lay women was such a huge part of my Catholic grade school education. So I, I see this as, as closing the loop in many ways. Um, so I'm sharing my screen. Does everyone see the screen? Okay, great. So um, as Kristen said, I'm just gonna launch right in. Uh, I see my presentation today complementing Astridas um, in many ways. And, and what I hope to do today is by introducing the, some concepts and some of the challenges that women face in the workplace to scope out of focus on family and really just center women themselves. When I think about teachers and the work that we do, especially Catholic school teachers, because I will always have a soft spot for Catholic school teachers, um, the commitment to service uh, inhibits women from centering themselves and taking care of themselves. And so providing the language and the vocabulary today is really a chance to give all of us a minute to think about how we take up space and what our personal needs are as we navigate um, the pandemic and, and our daily lives. <clears throat> so, always checky. Okay, great. So I thought I'd set the stage with this um, cartoon. Uh, and here I show, right, a group of men at a table with one woman where she tries to share an idea and you know, the company leader says, well, that's an excellent selection mix mistrix. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it, right? And here I want to point out a few things, especially when I think about um, the structure of Jesuit schools. Uh, first, right, there's a lot of men are in leadership and lay women are, are have challenges, one, because they may not be religious or they may not be in order. And so there's all these sets of rules that they have to navigate. And two, um, especially thinking about my own education, women teachers, um, are a huge part of the Catholic school education experience. And so as they're managing the structure of these, um, as you all are managing the structure of Catholic schools or your Jesuit schools um, with these complicated power dynamics, sometimes it may seem that your ideas aren't given credit because there's such a complex power structure that you have to navigate. Okay, so an overview of today's presentation. First, I will discuss, my mouse is not working. Uh, the state of affairs, what, is, what does the workplace look like for teachers um, after two years of COVID? Then I'll define um, 
unconscious bias which operates in the workplace and how this um, affects women's um, workplace experiences. From there, I'll introduce a few concepts on some of the workplace challenges you may be facing and then close with strategies. For me, one of the key parts of um, and benefits of working at this research lab is the fact that I get to translate research into practice. So it's really my pleasure to be here and, and, and not just introduce concepts, but really begin the conversation about how we can respond to the challenges that we face in the workplace. So first, <laughs> let's talk about the state of affairs. Right, when I and, and Astrida talked a lot about this, um, and I just wanna expand on what she says and compliment. So first there's transitioning between remote and hybrid teaching and learning. Right, what does it mean? What technology resources do you have at home? What training did you have support in making the transition? How did you balance this, uh, this sort of whiplash of like going back into the office or going into the classroom and then coming back out? Second, the overlapping shifts. We heard a lot about parenting in the first presentation, right? But it's not just parenting. When I think about educated women, we must note that many of us, the more degrees we get, the less likely we are to have children or we delay them later. So not only are we parents, but we also have to think about our, our own parents and how we're doing that. And when I think about teachers in this space, you're also managing the families that you work with, right? So it's your responsibility to the parents that you work with, it's a responsibility to your own families, and it's also the responsibility to yourself. So there's all this kind of work and from all the, that we have, that teachers have to engage in when they're in, um, on a daily basis that needs to be given credit and needs to um, be named. Thirdly, competing demands. Thinking about these shifts and the different audiences that you have, the question becomes, how do I take care of myself when I'm needed in all these other spaces? Right now at the research lab, we're embarking on this research project on remote work and how it's affecting women's experience in the workplace. And over the last two years, what we've discussed is how, again, complementing Strita's research, is that the number of the amount of work women are doing at home has increased, right? Oftentimes women are responsible for taking care of whether it's their children or their adult parents, while their husbands who may be in more um, elite professions uh, get to focus on work more. And then lastly, technological difficulties. One of the things I think about, especially in the, in the arena of education is not only the technical difficulties teachers are facing, but also their students. When I think about the population of students who tend to go to Catholic schools, um, especially and the stress around youth, how are they managing multiple people on the internet, right? How, how comfortable are people using Zoom? And just that transition from, uh, and how quickly that transition happened from doing everything in the classroom to having to do everything online. Um, yeah. And so I thought I'd share this image. Right, when I think of teachers, this is what I think you're dealing with. It's, it's the teaching, it's the remote work, it's the stress that comes with the transition. Um, it's finances, what resources do you have to support this transition and these technology um, concerns. So now that I've defined the state of affairs, I wanna transition into talking about the stressors of women in the workplace. This is a list developed from the 2020 McKinsey Report on Women in the Workplace. What's really nice about that report is it comes out every year and they survey hundreds of organizations to document what challenges women are facing each year. And the last two reports have had a particular focus on COVID. And here is just a laundry list. So first we can think about discrimination and what that looks like um, and how it's gotten worse because of these technological barriers. Second is financial strain. Third, family dynamics. And family dynamics are not just spouse and children, but whatever that looks like. When I think of single and child-free women, right? What does it mean to be this isolated, right? And, and sometimes absent from the conversation of challenges regarding um, what COVID has done to our experiences in the workplace. Fourth, harassment and how that's changed virtually. Uh, fifth, isolation. Six, changes in relationships. It's those water cooler conversations that are so important to helping mitigate our stress are now absent unless we are um, overtly intentional, creating those spaces. And then lastly, illness and injury. How do you manage your health, both physical and mental, when all of these changes are happening and the infrastructure you have to address these changes may be limited if they exist at all. Okay, so from here, what does this lead to? It leads to burnout, right? You're, we're spread in a thousand different directions. Our resources may be different across the board. And then we have to think about how do we exist and take care of ourselves in this space. And so again, going back to the uh, Women of the Workplace report, this year, 
um, one of the things they did measure is burnout. And what they found was that women are more burned out than men, than men and it's increased since for, between 2020 and 2021, right? So in 2020, 32% of women versus 28% of men were burned out at work. And this year in 2021, or last year, it, it's gone up um, to 42% right, from the 32%, whereas men has, have gone up to 35%. So again, just signaling there are gender differences in how <laughs> in this burnout outcome, right? And again, thinking about teachers in this conversation of hybrid work and all the reading I'm doing, they're almost missing from the conversation. And teachers can't, and without supporting teachers, right, the people in corporate America who have children, right, can't do their jobs if we're not investing in, in investing and investigating the challenges teachers face navigating this structure. So now that I've outlined the challenges and the dangers of you know what happens to a lot of teachers and women in particular in this space, I want to define bias. <clears throat> now bias is a cognitive shortcut people use to define who gets to do what. And I, I want to discuss three different forms of bias. So first there's extra scrutiny, right? Thinking about the structure of Jesuit schools and who gets to be in power and the legacy of the Ignatian structure. Um, how do lay women fit into this and how are they evaluated in the workplace? How, is their, how are their contributions evaluated in the workplace? And often, and what we learn from other research on women in other industries is that women are hyper, uh, they are, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the word right now. Um, they're scrutinized because they're so different, right? There's concern about, do they wanna be a mother? Are they married? How does that influence their status of work? Because the assumption is, is women are supposed to be mothers and partners versus full-time workers. Second is a higher bar. Again, when it comes to the, the idea of this ideal worker, and because most workplaces are designed for heterosexual men without children, um, because of these assumptions around motherhood and home care work, right? Women are held to a higher bar because there's this fear they're gonna leave the workplace, unless the additional criteria. While they may meet the technical credentials, uh, women sometimes when they're being evaluated at the workplace, different rules or different criteria are added to evaluate their performance, often slowing down their advancement in the workplace and making it harder to do their jobs. Now, why is this important? When I think about the structural challenges of COVID and then the different forms of bias women have to navigate, it then exacerbates the stressors that women are facing in the workplace. And now I'm gonna shift to de define some of these concepts to help us understand what the, the, the right words to describe what we're experiencing. And the three concepts are first, invisible labor, two, the inclusion labor clause, and three, the inclusion tax. And right now, what I'm gonna do is define each concept. <clears throat> so first, invisible labor, right? When I think about right, women as the assumed managers of the household, um, there's a heavy mental load. And the picture on the right, Right? It's like, remember that you have to have, add kind butts to the shopping list. Remember that you should have paid the caretaker. Remember that today's deadline to order your vegetable delivery for the week. So you're managing the house, but you're also managing your workplace. And the definition of invisible labor, which is from um, a 1987 study, is the unpaid work that goes unnoticed, unacknowledged, and thus unregulated. Examples include, one, household labor. We've heard a lot, we've heard a lot about that today. Second, Child care and or elder care responsibilities. Child care or the second shift has been studied extensively in the social sciences. Elder care is a relatively new phenomenon, probably in the last 20 years. Third, code switching. When you think of lay teachers um, and the complexity of the Catholic structure, it's like, how do you, how do you translate um, Catholic norms to, to non-Catholic families? And how do you navigate the, um, the formal and informal rules of what Catholic education is to, to, to families who have different experiences with the Catholic structure. Fourth, emotion work. This idea of regulating emotions during informal interactions. When women and underrepresented groups encounter uncomfortable situations, they have to regulate how they're going to respond to these situations, right? So assumptions about parenthood, assumptions about your responsibilities in your household, assumptions about, um, how you're taking care of the extended family, right? And how that's interpreted not only at work, but in other social interactions. And so all this invisible labor is really a huge part of the stress women um, are experiencing in the workplace. Second is the inclusion labor clause. And what does it mean? 
<clears throat> it's the requirement to perform unacknowledged and uncompensated labor and to pay additional taxes to be included in social and professional environments. Uh, I remember growing up, it, um, the way priests interacted with students and the way the lay teachers that interacted with students was very different and they had to manage um, these power dynamics, right? So when I think about the inclusion labor clause in the Jesuit um, educational contest, it's the different kinds of work uh, lay teachers have to engage in to learn the Jesuit structure, right? Not, uh, I'm, I'm going to guess, not all Jesuit educators are product of Jesuit schools. And even if they are, like it's one thing to be a product of a school, it's another thing to spend your entire life, right? As most priests and brothers do in this space, right? And so there's extra labor lay women have to engage in to quote unquote, catch up to these spaces. And then lastly, is this idea of an inclusion tax. And it's levied in the form of time, money, and mental and emotional energy required to gain entry and acceptance to, um, acceptance from institutional spaces designed for one particular group. So it's really um, acknowledging that not to be embedded in this structure and to come in as a foreigner or as different really just adds extra stress to, to people who are quote unquote different. And while the last two concepts were coined in, this, in studies of um, black women lawyers, as I was thinking about this presentation, I kept thinking about the divide between lay teachers, priests and brothers. And, and, I, and I thought these concepts were really a useful way to frame what may be um, tensions in the workplace. So lastly, I wanna talk about strategies. First, build networks with other teachers, right? Do not suffer in silence. When Kristen first came to me and told me she was doing this and this was the first time I thought this was great and we were talking before this presentation about how, how excited some of you were that this space exists. When I think about the challenges women face in the workplace, we often don't talk to each other about what they are, right? And when we create spaces to have those conversations, things become better because sometimes it's just knowing that you're not the only one helps mitigate the stress, right? And in these networks, we can share challenges and brainstorm strategies, right? Once we get, once we be, get comfortable being vulnerable to share our challenges, it then becomes, okay, now that we're all struggling through this, what can we do to change the situation? Second, raise awareness. Part of that can be done with events like this and conversations like this. Part of it can also be done in, um, building networks with other women. And then the question becomes, how do you raise awareness in your schools um, and in your structures and have these and, and to continue to build on the energy, right? And by raising awareness, engage curious people who are in positions of privilege. And what I mean by this is whether it's, um, it's important to think about who's curious about this question of what lay teachers are going through, right? If there's a priest or if there's a brother who wants to learn more, he may be in a position of privilege to create change. So have conversations with them versus the people who are who decide to remain ignorant to the challenges or are not curious because it protects your energy. Second, hold informal and formal events. Creating, formalizing, no matter how you know structured as today is, or just like having a coffee, you know, coffee or happy hour. These events allow allows foster spaces not only to build relationships but to really educate others about what's going on. Third, anticipate backlash. These are difficult conversations to have. Making visible the invisible labor that teachers are engaging in is really hard because it's such a mission-driven profession that sometimes the assumption is that should be enough and that should be, it just goes with the job. Um, however, to really do your jobs well, it's a matter of having these conversations to then create better workplaces so you can do them better. The, when I think about the amount of stress, especially teachers, right? Because they're so, <laughs> in many cases, under-resourced. Um, it's really important to have the confidence to build these relationships um, and just be able to anticipate that people may not like naming problems. And then lastly, establish a small wins approach. What I mean by this is having this event is such a big deal to have these conversations, to begin to, to make visible the challenges you all are facing. And so, and when you create these small wins, right, small steps that, bit, you know, that can eventually create structural change, um, if it allows for patience and it allows for persistence. And with that, that's all I have. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm.
Right. All right. Um, thank you, Melissa. You know, it strikes me that one of the key goals of this symposium is creating space to learn together. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. I think you're offering us a language to articulate our collective experience, probably a language that we didn't have before. And again, this idea of opening all of our eyes. So I thank you for that. There's so much that strikes me about what I just heard. Um, again, that we can dig into in the, the uh, Q&A period, but thinking about you know, this, I, this, the language of competing demands, isn't that interesting? I have not used that uh, myself uh, before, but how, how much it really does resonate and that the amount of work that women are doing at home has increased regardless of if, if you are a mom or if you don't have children, but all of us have family responsibilities. And so again, holding on to that and thinking about it and that women have indicated more burnout uh, than men uh, recently. I'll be interested to know we've recently undertaken a, a short pop-up survey for the JSN on burnout. Be interested to know if, um, if we have experienced that as well. So more to come. And then the idea of emotional work um, and how regulating emotions during informal interactions um, is, is really kind of seen as extra labor. So again, thank you for, for giving us so much to think about and especially for, for giving us a language here um, for what we're trying to, to, uh, to celebrate and to experience here. We'll now turn to our first uh, Ignatian educator reflection. Uh, Ms. Cristina Vela is Director of Equity and Inclusion and a Spanish teacher at Regis Jesuit High School. Uh, where she has worked since 2001. As the Director of Equity and Inclusion since 2005, she has coordinated DEI programs with students and faculty, staff, parents, and community partners. She is the in-house consultant on diversity issues and works with many local community organizations. She plans Regis Jesuits annual diversity conference has organized three National Jesuit Student Diversity Conferences, as well as Regis Jesuit's annual immersion uh, to the UN's Commission on the Status of Women. And she has served on the committee to plan the inaugural Jesuit School's Global Leadership Summit. Over the last five years, Chris has worked to update hiring practices to attract more diverse faculty, helped academic departments better integrate culturally responsive pedagogy and global mindedness into their curriculum and offered students a space for challenging conversations around equity and inclusion on a local and a global level. Christina has served on several committee, committees within the Jesuit network, including a province slaveholding curriculum design committee, a race audit racial examine committee and the JSN global mindedness group. She holds a BA in English with minors in Spanish and business from John Carroll University. She has lived in Argentina, Spain, Costa Rica, Peru, and Mexico, and earned her master's in Spanish from California State University at Sacramento. In her free time, Chris enjoys teaching her three-year-old daughter how to ski, cleaning marker off her one-year-old son's face, being forced to listen to Frozen 1 and Frozen 2, which I can feel your pain, on repeat during every car ride, uh, hiking, camping, and enjoying all things outdoors. So I'll turn it over to Christina. Um, I have so many thoughts swirling in my head after listening to both of our first two speakers. Um, but I think I wanna start with a story. Um, two Fridays ago, um, I walked into the house after work and my husband had been at home all day long with the kids because our um our babysitter wasn't able to be there that day and and he's he's on the couch and he's just like oh, on the couch just exhausted toys are everywhere like I cannot step any place on the ground as I like from the the door all the way to the couch like there's not a spare space for me to put a foot um let alone put anything down um and, and he's, he's just groaning. He's like, I'm exhausted. I got nothing done today. I'm like, well, of course you did it. You have a three-year-old and a one-year-old that you're babysitting today, babysitting, that you're watching, taking care of today. Um, of course you didn't get anything done. Like they are taking all of your time. He's like, I'm gonna get no sympathy from you, am I? No, 
you just got home from a 14 day work trip where you weren't here at all. So no, you're gonna get no sympathy from me. Um, but I think of this story when uh, Melissa was talking about some of those things that really draw us away and are the invisible work, right? Um, and, and I know that all women in Jesuit education aren't mothers. Um, and many unmarried women um, also kind of feel that, that there are certain expectations for them um, to be at school all the time, that they attend everything, that they participate in every retreat and every immersion, and, and, and that they put in all of this extra time because they're a representative um, and it's important for them to be there and they don't have a family at home. Um, and, and sometimes those opportunities are the only opportunities that they get where leadership might be offered. So they might end up grasping at some of those opportunities. Um, but that brings me to this thought about, you know, as Kristen mentioned, and, and as Melissa alluded to as well, like our Jesuit schools were created when um, Jesuit priests and brothers ran them and they didn't have families to go home to, their work life, their work and their life um, was, was the school, like that was it. Um, and I do think that that still permeates, uh, that still hangs in the air of all of our Jesuit institutions. Um, this kind of feeling and thought that the more present you are, the more committed you are. The more you are in person, the more loyal you are. The more you sign up for X, Y, or Z, um, the more dedicated, the more of a, a value asset you are. Um, and, and sometimes that tax, to use some of Melissa's language, um, can be really, really challenging. Um, it can be a, a, a struggle to have a work-life balance, any sort of mental break. Um, and this is not something that just women in Jesuit education have to deal with. Um, men have to deal with the same thing. But but I think that when we when we consider the number of things that oftentimes women are pulled into doing um, that invisible work, um, the 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 um, comic that Melissa showed at the beginning um, kind of made me chuckle because of the number of times that that type of thing has also come up as well. Um, but the things that that pull us away, right? The things that. Um, that, that well, we have a contractor that's coming and, and my husband can't miss work. So I have to be the one that stays at home um, or my kid is sick um, and my husband's out of town. And so I'm the one that has to stay at home. Um, you know, there are, there are those type of things that often fall to us um, to, to take care of things. And how is that, how is that responded to? Um, how is that treated? Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of women in our buildings, um, and not just not just here at Regis Jesuit, but women across the network, um, who've talked about um, frustration, uh, sometimes a lack of understanding of things that they might need to go home to. Um, I had a conversation with a teacher one day who was expressing frustration about some expectation that the administration had just recently set out. And I can't remember what it was, this was a while ago, um, but I really, what, what she said struck me. Um, she said, the administration is making all of these decisions, but they all have wives at home running the household and making sure that they can be here at all hours of the day. I don't have a wife at home. I am the wife in my home. And I, I really, I, I sat there and I thought about that. And I was like, yeah, when I go home, I have a lot of those additional things, the lists, you know, the, the I'm making the list for the grocery store and I'm making the list for, for, the, the other things and I'm making lists to pay to make sure the bills are paid and I'm making sure that that we're paying for our child care and I'm making sure that like all of those additional lists, the bills and whatever um, end up being on my plate. Um, my, another story, my husband was at home another day um, with the kids and he was like, man, I can't get any of my projects done. Like, I was like, well, I mean, you could do the laundry while you're home. And he was like, oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's a good idea. Um, and I came home and, and he did do the laundry. He did his laundry. Um, but the two baskets of kids clothes were still there for, for me to do. And I was like, man, I was really looking forward to coming home to some clean laundry. Um, but, but that type of thing is in my head, like, okay, I have to make sure that these things are done. And, and he didn't 
it didn't even cross his mind. Like it really didn't even think about the fact that he could also do their laundry too. Um, so I think that those are some of those invisible labor things. Um, and, and sometimes as a consequence, that means that I'm up until midnight trying to get everything done. Now, let's be clear, anybody who knows me knows that I was up till midnight way before I was married or had children. Um, that is not a new thing at all. I feel like I get my best work done at that time. Um, but some of that is because this work can be all consuming. This can be, and, and some of those invisible taxes that it doesn't matter whether or not you have a family at home, but you just need some of that mental um, release um, are things that I refuse to let go of. You know, so for me, um, being able to hang out with friends, being able to participate in a book club, being able to exercise every day, kids took that away from me, but that's beside the point. Um, th those are things that I refuse to not prioritize and so that meant that in order to get all of the stuff that was put on my plate done, um, sometimes you just have to stay up later um, in order to be able to accomplish it all. Um, because we come from a history of schools run by people who went home to be in community with other people who, who were doing the same thing, whose sole focus was creating what was to be done. And now that we don't necessarily have that, where communities that are much more lay, um, there's still a sense of that in the air, right? Let's see what else we can do. Um, I, I th the other thing that that I wanted to to talk about a little bit um, was in terms of like rising into positions of leadership, or in terms of like being on campus and hearing your voice. Um, that that leadership that are in official formal leadership positions. Um, we don't see a ton of that on our campuses. Um, we have some really strong, powerful women across the network um, who we can absolutely look up to, um, but there aren't a ton of them. Um, and sometimes they're not broadcast broadly um, in our different schools as to who these people are. Um, and so that can sometimes be challenging. Um, and, and I know that there are a lot of times when women don't feel like their voices are heard. Um, and this is the comic that Melissa put up that, oh, hey, that's a great idea. Maybe one, in the, maybe one of the men in the room can share that idea out loud with everybody so that we can actually go ahead with it. Um, I think that there are an awful lot of people in our communities that feel like they're sometimes talked over, that their ideas aren't shared or, or aren't valued. Um, and that sometimes feel like um, they themselves um, don't receive the same sort of value and respect. And, and I don't I don't mean to say that that's everybody, but I know that that that, that is a, a a feeling that a lot of people have. Um, maybe it's not all the time, but maybe it is. Um, I, I think to some of those invisible taxes um, prevent people from choosing to move into positions that are more formal leadership positions. Um, so for example, this year, um, for the first time I was really excited, I was encouraged to apply for an open AP position. Um, on hand, I was super excited and enthused by the prospect um, of a leadership role that I could easily see myself in. Um, that I truly believe that I'm qualified for and that I could do an amazing job at. Um, but the demands of time that would pull me away from my family, from my small children, are greater than the ones that I have with my current role um, because it would be new and therefore I would need to put more effort um, into learning something new. Um, and, and honestly, for me, that was really daunting, that extra time um, that in conjunction with hearing about the experiences of women in different leadership roles who didn't feel heard and often feel devalued or dismissed. Like I wasn't ready for the emotional energy that I would bring home every day with that type of frustration, um, which would pull me away from my family even when I'm with them um, because of that frustration. Um, so I chose to not apply to stay in a space that I feel respected and valued for what I bring um, but that's also something that that goes into some of those reasons that we don't see women at top leadership positions. 
work-life conflict, the inclusion tax, all kinds of different things. Um, there are two things that also in reflecting on this that I, I really do wanna mention that have really been sustaining for me. Um, and the first is um, Kristen calls, called this um, the power of women um, in leadership. The informal power of women in leadership is something that I really think is really important on our campuses. Um, and I think it's obvious and evident. Um, students who really feel drawn to their female teachers, students who really feel drawn to their female counselors or to staff members, um, the way that, um, that, that women are, are able to lead retreats and immersion programs and have a true impact. Um, if what we're doing is to create, if, if our business is forming students, then just us being here on campus and participating in the daily life of the school um, is absolutely a level of leadership. And I think that that's really important. Um, and even if we're not in formal leadership positions, those that informal power um, is also very real and I think really evident um, throughout our schools. And the other thing that I that I want to talk about is um, Melissa mentioned something about like how like what are some strategies right in order to um, to handle things. Um, one of the things that we've been doing here at Regis since 2008 um, is something that's called the Women Ignatian Spirituality Evenings. Um, we call it WISE because we are all wise women. Um, and we gather monthly to go through a process of sharing, um, supporting each other, being women in Jesuit education, but with a spiritual lens. It is an Ignatian Spirituality Evening. Um, we exist because we need each other. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't exist because Regis supports it. Um, it exists because we need the space. Um, we need to be able to vent to each other, to recognize our shared challenges. Um, and, and so I think that while Regis does support it, I think even if Regis didn't, um, we would still exist. Um, because what we have learned over the years is we've had members who've left our school but remained in our WISE group. Um, and as members who have joined our WISE group who are never employees at the school, um, it's still that ability that we all need to be able to connect to other strong females in a supportive environment that touches us both personally and spiritually. And this is something that's been really essential. So I just wanted to kind of close with that idea of the need for support, the need for a supportive network um, in order for us to continue and to remember that our, our main business um, is really to help each other. And in helping each other, we then end up helping our students grow in so many more challenge or amazing ways. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, you know, thank you for bringing to life some of these con concepts that we are learning. And again, the language that we're learning, this whole idea of invisible labor, formal and formal leadership that you referenced, really bringing to life and adding context and anecdotes to the, the spirit of, of what it means to have a work-life conflict. Uh, it just resonated deeply with me. So thank you. Especially resonated with me when you said um, that uh, professional women who have great ownership and love their careers, as so many of us do, really do feel expectations. And so that idea of the more present you are, the more loyal you are perceived, um, the more that you sign up, whatever that might be, um, the more engaged you are. So I think that leaves us with a lot to think about. Um, also, the way that you said rising in to positions of formal leadership um, it was just very powerful. So thank you for that. Thank you for, thank you for your willingness to share your own personal stories uh, to further these conversations that we're having. I'll transition now uh, to our next session. Uh, we'll be led by Dr. Deborah Mooney, uh, Vice President for Mission and Identity at Xavier University, who is responsible for promoting the active engagement of the campus community in carrying out the Jesuit Catholic mission of the university. As a licensed psychologist uh, and with a career focused on developing mission conscious leaders, uh, 
She has authored papers in academic journals, for example, the International Journal of Educational Management and the Journal of Leadership Studies, as well as two books, Leading with Moxie and Leadership Mastery and Moxie, a guide and journal for career women. She will share today her insights on cura propria, an essential Ignatian virtue for women working in our schools. Dr. Mooney. Thank you, Kristen. Well, in this Ignatian year, the Superior General, Father Arturo Sosa, has invited all of us in the Ignatian family to continue in the service of faith and the promotion of social justice and to advance on the four universal epistolic preferences uh, to guide our work from 2019 to 2029. This challenge was made especially difficult in the midst of a global pandemic. I have to say early on, uh, back in Delta, the Delta variant before a vaccine was even uh, on the horizon, I had the opportunity to facilitate a group of uh, leaders on our campus to think more deeply about those universal stock preferences and what did that mean for our work. And in the midst of talking about that third preference, journeying with youth in the creation of a hope-filled future, one of my colleagues, she burst out and said, if we are going to help our students be hopeful, then we need to be hopeful. We need to be models. I think that her um, impressions um, are quite accurate and maybe more profound than we first realized when she said it even. We know the sayings, you can't give what you don't have, or you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of anyone else. So in that way, if we put that in the context of the universal upstock preferences, we can't uh, accompany young people in the creation of a hope-filled future. We can't care for our common home. We can't walk with the poor and outcasted. We can't educate students intellectually, morally, and spiritually to be men and women for others unless we first take care of ourselves. I think this is important, um, especially now, um, as we're, knock on wood, we're leaving a global pandemic. But as you've heard over and over, we are in the midst of a psychological pandemic. You've just heard a number of statistics. Every time we turn on the news, we hear some, but I'd like to highlight uh, a couple of recent ones. We know that students under the age of 12 are um, seeking, help, seeking help for anxiety, stress, and depression has skyrocketed. Um, Astrid had mentioned um, the study by the Surgeon General that was uh, presented in December. And he was focusing on um, adolescent students. And what he said is 25% of the sample has reported stress levels that are now at critical and concerning levels. He said that one out of every three high schoolers have persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. 43% said they had a panic or anxiety attack and 63% of the students reporting having had an emotional meltdown. But you know, we know how they're feeling because we are feeling the same way. Their struggles are our struggles. Globally, anxiety rates are, uh, anxiety and depression are up 25% and that percentage is higher for Women, student, women, which is interesting in that Surgeon General study, the 25% was also higher for female students. Nationally, according to the US Census Bureau, before the pandemic, 6% of people said that they had feelings of anxiety. In the midst of the pandemic, it was up to 36%. Kristen just mentioned a study that's gonna be done by the JSN. Well, the National Education Association has just finished a study that was presented last month I hope um, the numbers aren't similar because they're pretty astonishing. 
of the for the, the respondents of the National Education Survey, 90% of the teachers said that they, they had feelings of burnout. 67% were at serious levels. Interestingly, 55% of the sample said that they were thinking of leaving the profession earlier than that they had thought of. And that number is up from the beginning of the year. We haven't even finished an academic year. At the beginning of the year, it was 37%. 37% to 55% and the numbers are higher for um, African-American and Latina teachers. The buildup um, is compounded by racial tension, political discord, and global warfare. And we know that all the isms, poverty, and environmental degradation impacts uh, women even more so. The American Psychological Association, last one, the American Psychological, Psychological Association annually um, since 2007 does a, uh, presents a study called um, Stress in America. And it too was just presented last month. What they said is researchers were shocked. I don't think that's an interesting word. Researchers were shocked to find so many Americans stressed over the same things. We don't usually see 80% of people telling us that a particular stressor or was stressful for that many individuals. The two stressors that hit 80% or higher, 80% was the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 87% of us said, inflation and rising costs of food and gas are impacting us. Again, the, this is the highest proportion of adults seen across all stressors asked in the history of the Stress America survey. And they really believe it's because of the constant stream of crises without a break over the past two years. So we're on the verge of a professional crisis as we struggle to maintain our well-being amongst greater expectations and workload demands coupled with the uncertainty um, and experiences over the past years that have taken our toll. We need strategies and techniques to combat this wave. And those of us in the Ignatian family have that. I'm gonna present seven Ignatian tools that I think are helpful. Um, I don't think any one of them are going to be unique um, or something that you haven't heard, but I'm hopeful that hearing them today as a package you'll find a bit of peacefulness um, as I review them. I'd like to first talk a bit about the philosophy, however. Um, those of us in the Ignatian family were familiar with cura personalis and cura apostolica. Cura personalis is care for the whole person, care for the whole student, mind, body, spirit, intellectually, morally, and spiritually. Cura Apostolica is care for the organization or institution or the school. I think that in the midst of this global pandemic, we need a new Ignatian virtue to help us be effective educators and to support our students in developing a hope-filled future. I propose that we have what we call cura propria or care for oneself. As I was kind of figuring out what noun adjective Greek pairing there would be, I consulted my colleague and friend, uh, a classicist. And when I was explaining this idea, she said, if ever there was a time we needed cura propria, it's now. And when I say time, back in Ignatius's time and Xavier's time, um, this wasn't thought about. And in fact, it was almost the opposite. Ignatius was known to very intentionally, um, almost self-harm. He restricted himself with adequate food, shelter, and clothing. And he thought that that would make him a better person up until towards the end. And in fact, Francis Xavier uh, was known on his deathbed to be, quote, lying, exhausted, and spent from compulsively working and excessive fasting. But you know, I'm not sure things have changed a whole lot today. Um, sometimes when we think about self-care or well-being, um, and especially for women, we tend to think of it as self-focused, um, selfish, self-absorption, maybe even narcissistic. And it's for this reason, this kind of sociocultural pressure uh, or stronghold that I think we need to consider cura propria as a moral good 
and a contemporary virtue in this post-pandemic um, world for our well-being and the ability to serve others. Uh, Sarah Gottfried is known to say, and this is well beyond before the pandemic, but I love this quote. She says, we need to replace our vicious stress cycle with a vicious cycle of self-care. So if we use those uh, Ignatian terms of reading the signs of the times, we need a new way of proceeding. So I offered these seven tools for, for cura propria. The first is to identify daily gratitudes. Now this goes back to even Ignatius's time, but what's really exciting to me is research uh, more recently is finding some really wonderful, maybe even miraculous things about uh, people that have quotes an attitude of gratitude. Um, so internally, intrapersonally, we're more likely to be optimistic and happy. Interpersonally, we're more like to, likely to be empathic, helpful, compassionate, and forgiving. Physically, we're more likely to pick healthy foods, stick to an exercise plan, get good sleep, and even have lower blood pressure. Spiritually, if we attribute those um, daily gratitudes or those blessings to the divine, we're seeking to find God in all things. Daily uplifts over time have a great impact in mitigating daily hassles. The second tool is to find inspiration. Inspiration literally means divine influenced in breathing or God breathe. So when we are inspired, um, we're more likely, we're, we're experiencing, we're encountering God. And when we're inspired, we're more likely to be inspiring. Third is self-awareness. We've all been changed and changed through the pandemic. And some things we've done, we want to keep. And some things we've done, we don't want to keep. They've helped us get through the pandemic, and that's fine. But we, it's a real important time right now to take some time for self-awareness, to see how we adapted um, through the pandemic, and to make those conscious decisions. I really like this quote from uh, Kristen Armstrong. She's an Olympian. She's not related to Lance Armstrong, but uh, she was a, a, a three-time Olympic uh, bicyclist. And she said, times of transition are strenuous, but I love them. They are an opportunity to purge, rethink priorities, and be intentional about new habits. We can make our new normal any way we want. The fourth tool is to pinpoint our desires through discernment. One of the wonderful things about Ignatius Loyola was he didn't just focus on his rational side, but he really appreciated affect or emotion. And he thought it was important to pay attention to both. Early on in the pandemic, you might've seen this meme. It really resonated with me. And it was a Corona coaster. It was saying we were on a Corona coaster of emotion. I think we could all relate to that. What's sad um, is that more recently, psychiatrist, Dr. Steven Seagal in speaking with parents, teachers and students said that we are, are all running out of what he called emotional elasticity. We're not able to handle that Corona coaster if I put those two together. Um, when that's pushed too far, you snap and we're living stretched. We're living fully stretched, he says. I think it's important to take some time to mourn. Many of us have lost family and friends through the pandemic in passing away, but we've all lost smaller things that are still important. We've lost connections. We've lost the ability to have some celebrations, some events, some connections. And I think we need to give ourselves some time to mourn um, and grieve over those losses, recognize them and grieve. Conversely, we may have noticed some yearnings, some desires. Uh, what Father Mark Theobode, Theobode would say, the great big desires that God has placed in our hearts. And it's real important at this point to take some time to discern, to see if 
if we experience consolation as we imagine ourselves making some changes to follow those great desires or to find out if maybe they are more um, superficial um, thoughts and ideas, again, as trying to help us to cope with um, the pandemic, to see the distinction and to use discernment, our rational and our effective side to make those decisions. Fifth is to focus on those that we love and care for. I mentioned the importance of focusing on ourselves and how we've been transformed. We also can be helped by help by noticing and finding out how our friends and family have been changed. Sometimes we take for granted that they're experiencing the same thing or that we might quote know what they're thinking, but we never know other people as well as just simply asking and finding out and finding out if we can be helpful to them. Being helpful to them is not only helpful to them, but it's helpful to us. Being helpful to others helps ourselves. The sixth one is rejuvenation. And I'm not sure that's so Ignatian, but to add the word, be intentional about it, I think it is. So intentionally focus on opportunities to rejuvenate. That might seem counterintuitive right now because in some ways we've literally and figuratively been still. We haven't moved much. But I think the analogy is very much like a long trip where you've been sitting for five to eight hours in a car or a train or an airplane, and you get to the place where your uh, destination is and you feel exhausted and you think, why? I've been sitting all this time. And I think in many ways, our bodies are experiencing, our bodies and minds are experiencing the same things through this pandemic. So we really need to focus on ways to be uh, rejuvenated. And seven, it, it's probably the most important one. It's the most important one that Ignatian thought, Ignatius thought the Jesuit should do, and that is to take five minutes a day for Ignatian daily examine. The reason that that's so important is it helps with all the other six that I've just mentioned. An Ignatian daily examine helps us to find gratitudes, to be inspired, to seek God, to find God, to be still, to be patient, to have self-awareness and to focus on those we love. I'd also encourage you to write your own Ignatian daily exam. Um, just as the saying goes, what is the best physical exercise to do um, to make you be healthy? And the answer is whichever one you'll stick with. I think the parallel is kind of the same for an Ignatian daily exam. You can Google and find a myriad of examines, but what, what prompts work best for you in noticing uh, the divine? What are you grateful for? When in your day were you closer to God, further from God, and how do you want to be tomorrow? Find prompts that fit you and your style. It has been said that self-care is doing things that make you feel more like yourself. So to feel and be more like yourself, it's imperative that we as women care for ourselves, that we have a vicious cycle of self-care and that we view this care as a virtue, a necessary Ignatian virtue so that we can live cura propria in order to have the spiritual, psychological and physical well-being necessary to thrive in our work in a post-pandemic world. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So thinking again about the language that we're all learning here together and to, to begin um, hearing the so much of the shocking statistics that you shared and hearing the uncertainty of the past years all framed within the context of Ignatian uh, spirituality is inspiring. You know, it struck with, it's stuck uh, with me when you said that we are leaving a global pandemic, um, but we are still in the midst of a stress and anxiety and depressive pandemic. And so what does that look like for us? And the idea that as we care uh, for our students, we all also need to care for ourselves, their struggles are ours. Um, and the language of emotional elasticity, a vicious cycle of self-care. And I especially appreciated uh, the quote that you shared on times of transition and that uh, we get to make 
uh, the new normal be what we want it to be? So for all of us on this call, what do we want it to be? That's one of the questions that we, we don't have an easy answer for, but left us with a lot to think about. So thank you, Deborah. Um, I will welcome now our next uh, Ignatian educator uh, reflection. Lorraine Shepard is in her seventh year as principal of Our Lady of Grace Sacred Heart Nativity School uh, in San Jose, California. Prior to this role as an administrator, she taught for 13 years in the Diocese of San Jose. Lorraine was the first in her family to graduate from college and holds a bachelor's degree in mass communications from the University of California, Berkeley, and a master's of arts in teaching from the University of San Francisco. Lorraine is an accomplished middle school principal, leading a school with 98% first generation students who focus not only on their academic and spiritual formation, but in developing their desire to work for social justice as they journey into high school and beyond. Leading a school through a global pandemic and all that has been unearthed has propelled her even more into diving headfirst into issues of educational equity through a lens of deep compassion and cura personalis. Lorraine is a graduate of the seminars in Ignatian leadership and currently serves as an adjunct professor in the seminars Ricci, uh, excuse me, adjunct uh, presenter for the sem in the seminars Ricci cohort. She has served on several planning committees for both the Jesuits West Province and the Jesuit Schools Network Principals Gathering. Lorraine. Thank you, Kristen. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank my colleagues um, in higher ed for all of your work and your research um, on the implications on COVID-19 and what it's doing for women. I really look forward to your future research on the impact on student behavior, because I think most of us on this call um, can ag do agree that that next round of research and, and what's going to work for our students will be really welcome. So um, like Chris, I'm going to start off with a story as well. Um, years ago, when I went to my first principals gathering, I think it was in DC and it was my first one. I was super excited and I had entered a presentation late. And so the presenter was speaking and then it was a turn and talk session. So I turned around and I was like, whoa, everybody at my table um, represented what I thought um, the, the former formal Jesuit leadership would look like. And I felt incredibly intimidated. I was able to speak and, and share, you know, my response to um, the question, but I remember that feeling. You just don't lose it when you're the only woman um, at the table. Um, and you're also the only person of color in, in this whole um, auditorium. So I haven't lost that feeling. I still remember it, but I know since years have passed, and I always share this with people um, or aspiring uh, formal leaders, that you earn that spot at the table, or let's just remove the table, and that you belong there. So I just wanted to put in a plug for keep coming um, to these events. Um, representation is super important, and um, we just need to continue to do that so our voice is heard. Just um, to piggyback a little bit on what Deborah shared with us on Cura Propria made me think about a position we created this year, which was a director of Cura Personalis um, for our students, right? With wraparound services, counseling, grad support, um, social worker, but we need Cura Propria for ourselves. We need to be a director for ourselves um, and to really um, take care of ourselves. This, um, I wanted to thank Kristen for giving me this opportunity to, to speak this afternoon because it really gave me a leading through a global pandemic and everything that came along with it. So I was just going to offer um, some reflections because I feel like whatever's going to come next, we can do this, right? I can do this and the people in my building um, can, also, can also do this. So what are some of the things that I did, right? Um, Dr. Abad spoke earlier about isolation and this being a super lonely position. There's no need to suffer in silence. Um, I feel like 
there is a certain degree of humility and vulnerability necessary when you are leading through a global pandemic or even in an informal way. But you need to be able to recognize when you need help. Um, I went to a presentation a few years ago when somebody spoke about compassion fatigue, and that's really stuck with me because most of us on this call are in helping professions where you give and you care and you're compassionate every single day. Um, but at some point that can get to you and you need to be able to recognize it um, and, and being able to say, yes, I do need help. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of of vulnerability that and bringing others into the fold. Um, another thing that really helped me was really holding on to our core values. Whatever your core values are, those are gonna guide your actions. Um, it's important to spend time alone and to reflect, right? Is hope one of my core values? Because all of those things are fundamental to leading you to making those decisions, um, be it a global pandemic, a reopening of school, or dealing with racial tension in your community. Um, another uh, reflection that I wanted to offer was empowering others. You don't need to do any of this alone, whether you're in a formal leadership role like I am, or you're not in a formal re leadership role. Um, I feel it's really important to build capacity in your circle um, and empower people in the building. You don't need to um, be on the admin team or a counselor to do this, to be able to check up on others. I, I felt like a good part of my day was checking up on other people. And I'm just going to put in a plug for everyone on this call, on this Zoom, to be able to check up on your leaders as well, male or female, because oftentimes they don't have that opportunity of somebody asking them, are you, are you okay? And I know when others have done that to me, um, I've really appreciated that. Uh, I was already, I was so distracted on what Deborah said about writing your own daily exam. In, and that is something I definitely want to take with me because I think developing that trust in God and trusting your instincts and being able to lead, whether you are a woman or not, I think that that's really important to be able to, to have that trust pulling from your core values to guide and lead your decisions. Um, I think it's also really important. This is, I wrote down like 10 points. So I'm on nine already. Um, but the ninth point in terms of self-care and leading through a global pandemic is to really recognize when it's time to slow down. You don't have to always stay up till midnight. I know Chris said that. Um, I don't think I could do that at my age, but Recognizing when it is time to slow down and to put the brakes on, because if that instinct is there in having you slow down, you have to listen to that because you do better work when you are fresh and ready to go. Um, I also like, and I think one of the speakers spoke about this earlier, really just focusing on a small wins approach. The more you can emphasize the gains in your institution or the gains in yourself, as opposed to the gaps, then you can build on those and you're building capacity in yourself um, and you're building capacity in the building. I, um, in preparation for um, the Zoom, I pulled out some of my journals because I journal a lot. That's one of the things that I like to do just to get my thoughts on paper. And I labeled them because I wanted to see like time frames. And I couldn't find, I found one that ended in February of 2020. And, and then I found another one that started in May of 2020. And I'm like, okay, I know I had written a lot in February and March and April because those were key times during the pandemic. And I wrote a lot. I wrote down my thoughts a lot just in, in what I was doing and what I needed to, to take on to reopen the school. And there were many times, and I think it's important to recognize this in yourself, that I was ready to say, I can't do this anymore. The responsibility is so heavy. It's heavy on me as the leader in the school. It's heavy on me as, as the female leader in the school. But every time I journaled, my closing thought was, if not me, then who? If not me, then who? And I think it's trusting yourself, trusting in God and trusting your instincts that being able to lead, whether it's a formal uh, leadership role 
or an informal leadership role in your institution, it's really important because representation is important and they need uh, more women like us, the ones on the call um, and the ones that will listen going forward. So just wanted to leave that with you, the, if not me, then who, um, and to ask yourself that. Think about what your non-negotiables are, but be able to use that um, to drive you forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, and thank you for, for, um, for giving us a sense of how it feels to be the only woman at the table, the only woman of color in the room. That was a powerful introduction there. And again, this idea of how it feels to lead a school um, during a pandemic. Uh, and the insights that you offer are really talk about a hope-filled future. I mean, that's really, that's really what you're imparting is the wisdom there. So, so thank you for that. And again, more language, holding on to our core values, the idea of empowering others, of recognizing when it is time to slow down. Um, and, and that the, the very poignant uh, note that you made about if not me, then who? So thank you for that. Um, we're grateful that you, uh, your willingness to share. I will now uh, um, introduce our concluding session. And as I do that, I'd like to uh, remind all of you um, after Jen presents, we will have some time for Q&A uh, with all of the panelists. So um, it, as, it, as it strikes you, uh, pop some questions or some insights there into the chat panel and, and we'll do our best to have that form our conversation. It's my pleasure to introduce Jen LeMaster. Associate Provincial Assistant for Secondary and Pre-Secondary Education for the Midwest Province. Previously, she was the Assistant Principal at Brebuff Jesuit Preparatory School, facilitating curriculum and instruction, adult mission and identity, professional development, state and federal reporting, accreditation, as well as Chair of the Department of Information Services. She presents regularly for the Jesuit School Network and other faith-based and public organizations on leadership, technology integration, data for mission decisions, faculty formation, and library services. She holds a BS in theater and speech education from Bradley University, a master's in library science from Indiana University, and a master's in educational leadership from Western Governors University. She is a graduate of the JSN Seminars in Ignatian Leadership and has been married to the Reverend George LeMaster, PhD, for 27 years. She is the proud mother of Linny, who's 22, and Will, who's 17, and through no fault of her own, caretaker of her four cats, which might just be the best line in a bio that I have ever heard. Jen will share this afternoon her reflections on how can women in Jesuit education support one another in a place of most potential. So Ms. LeMaster. Thank you, Kristen. And you got to meet one of those cats because it's dinner time here and they are uh, going to, and they love a good Zoom call. Um, wow, what a day. I, I, I'm just sort of floored. I've been taking notes this whole time and um, I'm just so inspired and, and hopeful uh, listening to all these things that we've heard and I am, I just keep thinking, um, none of us heard each other's talks until today. And it's really rather remarkable um, how it's all sort of starting to come together. And, and so here is, here's my offerings uh, from the table here from Indianapolis. I'm just gonna start with a quick moment of truth. The last place on earth that I and my parents ever saw me doing was working for the church. Um, I just remember I was, I was an antsy, bored kid in mass during the uh, early 1970s. And I remember daydreaming the time away in church as various men moved about the space. And I remember one stained glass window, one in this church um, had a window of Mary, you know, looking at adoration uh, for, to the baby Jesus. And, and six-year-old me learned that to be a woman in the church was to be a mother. And when I was about 10 years old, I went to altar boy training with my younger brother, thinking that it would at least give me something to do, only to be told that I couldn't participate because I was a girl. 
Uh, so my eight-year-old brother got to be a server and I got to sit in the pew. And I learned that to be a woman in the church meant that that's where I got to sit in the pew. In high school, I got into a heated argument with a young priest over birth control. And he and called my mother about my attitude and he gave me a C in morality class. And 16 year old me learned that to be a woman in the church was not to challenge male priests because they held all the power not only to chastise you in front of your peers, call your mom, but also give you low grades in CCD because in the old days you were graded in CCD. In college, I met my first nun, CCD, I was public school educated. Um, and she cursed like a sailor and she got it done. She was an office manager. She ran the parish education program. She handled finances, calendars, but she never led anything to do with worship, prayer, and heaven forbid, you know, sacraments. She was a business manager. So 19 year old me learned that to be a woman in the church meant you could lead the office. You could control the business day to day, but not do the real work of faith and leadership. I saw my first ordained woman lead worship with communion right at the Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church in 1996 in Princeton, New Jersey. I was 25 years old and I was uncomfortable. Here is a woman, a woman of color in a old traditional church preaching the world word wisely and passionately. And I struggled to accept she was worthy because I had only seen men do this. And I had internalized that only men could do this. And I wondered about my image of women in the church. And this is one of my first adult wake up moments of my spiritual journey. And I started looking around and reflecting on the other voices I had pushed aside because they were women, because my image of being a woman in the church at the time was more docile, a mother, a secretary, certainly no one who ever argued a point. But then through time, I grew up and I kept running into all these other images of women that ran contrary to what I had internalized. Uh, as you heard, I, I married the good Reverend Dr. Husband, who is a Presbyterian clergy, and I tried Presbyterian. I still go to Presbyterian churches. They're lovely, but it, it doesn't quite nurture the same. We tried, he and I tried, we'll meet in the middle, we'll go to an Episcopal church, but no other worship fed me like the Roman Catholic right. And then I, I really got scared because I could not identify or figure out my faith if not in the Roman Catholic church in a place that I didn't necessarily feel like I belonged. And then quite frankly, I got mad. <laughs> like for a decade, I got mad at the church and all of these things that mainly in part I had internalized. And then I ran into the 70 year old Franciscan brother who patiently listened to 40 year old me word vomit, all this upraising confusion, these feelings of being out of bounds and anger. And he said to me, you know, the thing about the church is it's big, it's global, it's messy. There's a lot of cultures, it's young, it's old, it's sick, it's healthy, it's loud, it's quiet, and it's our church too. We all have a place. And he asked me if I felt like fighting for my place in it. And that stuck. And through what can only be the work of the Holy Spirit, I joined the staff at Burbuff Jesuit in 2008. 
And in 2015, I walked through the spiritual exercises with spiritual director and laywoman extraordinaire, Ling Linda Hageman. And 45 year old me learned that to be a woman in the church means to be myself. That I am just as worthy to lead, even as messy as I am. And I don't have to create a definition based on any image or action imparted on me. I was loved and empowered just for being myself. So I'll be 53 later this month. And I love the Roman Catholic Church. I love the rituals, the smells, the bells. I love the invitation to divine nourishment in the mass and all of the messy, broken, beautiful people that make up the body of Christ. But I also scream in frustration, often literally, at the narrow, androcentric, complementary accompaniment patriarchy it still articulates. And I recognize that many cannot love the church because they don't feel the invitation and welcome. And I recognize that honestly, many of them have been explicitly not invited and explicitly made unwelcome. And I get it. I read an article not long ago that talked about the church needing both internal and external agents of change. That the church needs people on the outside who are pushing the church and they need internal change agents, those who still work within the hierarchy and stay inside and question and push. I fall more into that internal piece, to be honest with you. Some of you might be sort of a one foot in, one foot out space. All of these spaces, external, internal margins, they're prophetic spaces and they're places for our potential. So how do women, and I see you on this, men are non-binary kin and Jesuit education support each other to the place of fullest potential? Well, you've heard it all day today, and I'm gonna say it again. We use the gifts and tools of our Ignatian heritage, prayer and reflection, consciousness raising and discernment in common, and trust in God given talents to create a hope-filled future. The idea of this place of potential came from reading this great little article. It's very short called Dwelling in Possibility by Sister Pat McDermott. She's the president of the Sisters of Mercy in the Americas. And she was reflecting on all this post-COVID stuff and she was feeling kind of adrift. And she talked about this place of our most potential where our God-given gifts and our capacity join together. I love the metaphor put together, put forth by Sister McDermott. She talked about life not being a stream with, you know, stepping stones that orderly take us across waters, that life is more like an ocean. It's vast and there's all these currents and there's winds that push and pull. And like the stars used to be used for navigation, we sit in open water, feeling the navigational pull of the divine purpose. God gently, not so gently, pulls me in direction. The divine calls me to action brought to life through my precious gifts. My capacity swells in deep listening and my energy is found in that sacred pole. When I see the interconnectedness of hope and challenge like today. When I allow myself to listen with curiosity of what might become. And when all of those around me are open-hearted, willing and accepting of God's invitation to love, that's when the light Mary brought into the world shines. So finding our place of potential is not a solitary journey. 
like we've heard today and judging by my very scientific study of my Facebook page, women are so grounded in the world that we often live our days through lenses of unjust actions, broken homes and families, pain and grief and suffering. At the same time, we're cooking multiple meals a wet day we're taking care of these cats that keep showing up in our houses and matching socks. Particularly these past few years as our daily experience narrowed into our immediate circles, but on social media, we're watching global suffering play out. Where do we even begin to create a hope-filled future when you know, getting out of bed some mornings is the biggest thing that we'll do? I can't answer the question of what it means to be a woman in the church for any of you listening. That's a deeply personal relationship between you, God, and church. But I can ask you to consider the images you hold and pray on them. Listen to the deep desires that swell from your prayer. There's many methods out there to cultivate self-awareness and prayer. You've heard some from Deborah today, uh, some others, Reverend Ann, Howard, no, Reverend Ann Sutherland Howard offers an exercise where she says, draw a circle and put in all of the words that are the dominant culture in which you find yourself. And then start putting in words that you would describe personally and where your desires are pushing you and whether they fall in the circle or outside the circle in what she calls wild spaces or on the margins. These are moments of self-awareness of where you fit and your places of potential. You can try a life graph exercise from the Kairos retreat where you graph significant experiences in your life and list the feelings and the gifts and the challenges that arose and how it changed you. You can take the spiritual exercises. Our Ignatian tradition is rich with prayerful methods of discovery and cultivation of our potential. I mean, after all, St. Ignatius even tells us that's why we were created to share our gifts and potential with the world. But as women in the church, we can do some things. We can raise our consciousness by listening to each other's voices. Consciousness raising is a, a seeking activity. It was born of the 1970s feminist movement to make people more aware of personal, social, and political lived experiences. How Ignatian is that? <laughs> I invite you after praying with your personal journey to find ways to share your stories to create understanding. If you attend the JSN colloquium this summer, hopefully, Kristen, there'll be a time to share stories in a consciousness raising session. It's an early step to discernment in common, finding time and space where we can listen and share stories. We're not solving anything, we're not taking notes, but we're creating understanding of ourselves in the universal church and discerning together how to bring our prayers to life in the world. And finally, and uh, this is my hardest, you've heard it today too, placing our confidence in God and our gifts as we act on our deepest desires. In 2010, I saw women leading in JSCA out front. I saw women like Mary Thomas and Kathy Carl and Donna Endron I have seen women give reflections, lead prayer services, head retreats. I have seen women today share knowledge that I knew in my heart was true, but I love a good graph and a statistic to show me that I'm not alone in it. Share your gifts. I've seen men who reach out to women for wisdom and guidance as equals and sometimes as betters. If you're called to be a role model, own it. If you're called to be a mentor, reach out. If you're just beginning to dream and you're hearing all of this, make some tea and start journaling. 
if you're certain, if you're just curious and today was interesting to you, there are social media sites like Voices of Faith and the Leadership Conference for Women Religious and so many more that post research and talks and reflections. And you know what, if you're pissed off by it all, go yell and journal that because God can take it. And wherever you are, God is there too. And as you've heard too, again and again, reach out to one of us. We love it. Today is our first step, is a step, it's not really the first, it's a step to our hope-filled future. And honestly, tomorrow can be awe-inspiring. All right, so to wrap it up, in summary, Jesuit technique of repetition. How do we support each other in our places of potential? Prayer and self-awareness. Where are my gifts? What images do I hold? Where do I feel my navigational pull? And where does all that start to intersect? I draw Venn diagrams. I'm a nerd. It's how it works for me. Draw pictures, paint, write poetry, whatever it is. Consciousness raising. Offer conversation on potential. Con consciousness raising activities, they're formal listening processes. If you can participate in one, great. If you can lead one in your neighborhood, great. If not, grab a beverage of your choice and a trusted friend and tell your story. And finally, place confidence in God. Use your gifts. Shout it out when you see others use their gifts. Because when one of us succeeds, you know, we all succeed. So I'm not gonna lie, it sounds all easier. I've been working on this talk for a month, so it's all pretty and all of this. COVID is not over. I My parents tested positive for COVID yesterday. <laughs> They're fine, but we're living it. Uh, I got a conference to pack to go to tomorrow. Uh, my husband and son are gonna be alone for a week and details. I got dinner in the crock pot, I'm not gonna lie. But we <laughs> took these three hours together, two and a half, two hours and 15 minutes together to spend time together in community. And that's where it is in this time for prayer and reflection and insight and consciousness raising. The common themes today are mind boggling, <laughs> but it just shows it's happening and we're thinking about it and we're praying about it and we're here together to do something about it. And it works. When I go to mass nowadays to St. Monica's in Indianapolis, the images of women in glass and marble outnumber the images of men. This is fact accounted last Sunday. There are young people of all genders and abilities serving on the altar at that parish. And we even have a woman undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops with voting rights as of this year. It's happening. And we're here too, happening. So go, let's set the world on fire. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Awesome. That's, that is exactly how I had hoped that we might uh, end the speaker portion, portion of our presentation today. Thinking about what you said to be a woman in the church means to be myself the power of the invitation and the welcome, using the gifts and tools of our Ignatian tradition, fighting for our place, seeing the interconnectedness of hope and challenge, which is a wonderful way to articulate what I hope we are doing this afternoon. And then most significantly, raising our consciousness by listening to each other. Those are wonderful things to, to conclude the portion with our, our speaker's presentation. So thank you, Jen. We'll now take uh, a moment here. We are nearing the end, but we have some time for Q&A. So as we're spotlighting our, our six presenters here up on the screen, um, let me just take a moment to, um, to say, so we'll have an opportunity here to ask some specific questions to the presenters, hopefully to hear from them a bit more, to share the reflections that you have as well in a short period of time. I would encourage you as we are um, getting ready here for the Q&A to reflect on a few prompts. So you might think about what did you connect to here? 
Um, what moved you this afternoon? Um, can you describe a moment where you felt hope, where perhaps you felt that interconnectedness of hope and challenge that Jen spoke of? On the other hand, can you describe a moment where you felt frustrated or fearful? I'll give you a moment to gather your, gather your thoughts and your questions, and I, I will kick us off here. Um, so I'll have the, I'm not sure we have everyone on the screen, but we'll work on that. Heard um, from all six um, of our presenters. I'd give the presenters a, a moment today or a moment right now to, um, to speak with one another. What, what is one thing that you heard that you feel like would be a parting, um, parting idea that you are leaving with having listened to your colleagues here? So I'll ask anyone on the screen to just kind of jump in and I'm gonna look for, for uh, the others that we're missing. I'm, to I'm gonna totally steal Christina's uh, wise women thing that is and stinking tastic. So thank you for that. And I, I really do appreciate the research, uh, Melissa, that you have done and Astrida that you have done. That is, I'm just gonna, for those of us who live in a very male dominated role, being able to give statistics and, and I hate to say, take the emotion out of it, but it does really help tell the story to say, no, this is real and these are real numbers and these are the people we are serving. So thank you for all of that. I don't know that there's one thing from one person um, because as Jen mentioned, there were so many connections and overlaps. Um, I really appreciated Jen's framing around that internalization of where do women belong and where have we learned that we're, we belong. And I do think that a lot of the research that Melissa and Astrid talked about kind of goes along with that. Um, and then the Kira Propria and, and Lorraine's, like, I think that all of what we have said can kind of, you know, be summed up and where did we learn that we belong? I know I really appreciate it. I mean, it's um, to be an academic and Catholic is really hard because you're not, you know, there's very few spaces where you can engage both. And I was really struck by how the relationship between leadership and faith was described in the last piece, but also just a through line across, right? The like the complexity of what it means to be a woman and to be a woman worker in the Jesuit system, I feel like was highlighted across the different panels. So I'm just appreciative of all of you, um, the fellow panelists, everybody that's taken the time to attend today and wish that there was an opportunity like this seven years ago. So, so thank you, Kristen, for your work with this. I saw so many examples of ways to support one another and to build resilience um, in the Jesuit school community, whether it's individually in our faith practices, whether it's in the communities in our schools, whether it's in um, larger congregations or the national kind of network, but really these many, many opportunities for building support and resilience. That is what is gonna keep sustaining us as, as we forge on. Well, I, I noticed a takeaway, another string through all is despite all the challenges that everyone spoke of challenges, um, there is a hopefulness. Um, hopeful is a real powerful emotion. And again, emotions are so important. Um, and uh, I think in Proverbs isn't hope, um, um, a tree of life in so many ways we were all connected in our branches and leaves in that uh, tree of life. Thank you everyone. Um, I'm seeing such uh, uh, appreciative comments in the in the chat window which we are all really grateful for. 
Um, I think I will um, stick to our time here, adjust a little bit, pivot as we all love that word. Um, but to, to offer conclusion, I think probably ending on that note, getting to hear the reflections of the, the panelists after hearing uh, the six different contributions is probably exactly where we should be. So, so thank you for that. The power of women in Jesuit education, there really is so much that we could say. We could go on all afternoon, uh, but I'll do my best to keep us to the time that we had promised. As we conclude, I first offer you know, many thanks to our panelists who have so graciously shared uh, their work and their time and their personal learnings with all of us this afternoon. Uh, that's not an easy thing to do in the midst of the very full plates um, that, uh, that all of these remarkable women have, so thank you. I look forward to sharing the symposium recording uh, around the JSN websites and our various social media platforms, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, in the time ahead and you're most welcome and in fact encouraged to share the video widely amongst your own communities. Help us to get word out about the powerful conversations uh, that we, we shared today. I think the value of uh, celebrating the incredible impact of the women in our schools cannot be underestimated and I urge all of us to continue to find ways to do so within our own communities. To jo those that joined us this afternoon or are watching the symposium recorded, thank you as well for your time and for your engagement. I conclude by echoing what everyone before me has said by asking all of us to consider uh, how we can best follow up and learn from the important conversation that was raised today. So we might all ask ourselves, when we think of the power of women in Jesuit education, what comes next? What more can we all do to support? And as Jen challenged us, how can we help each other reach our place of most potential? So our hope is that we have left all of us with a lot to think about. Finally, on a programmatic level, uh, I share that we aim to offer similar virtual symposia in the future, again, on topics of timely relevance to our schools. Part of the idea is that we are staying in tune to the landscape uh, of issues that are of value to our schools and to the educators in them. So please be sure to listen for more information on this new format uh, of our JSN programming. We really aim to reach every Ignatian educator in our schools and we're we are hopeful that the virtual symposium will be one step along the path of this goal. So on behalf of everyone uh, that spoke today, all of our panelists, on behalf of the Jesuit Schools Network Conference Office team, thank you for being a part of our inaugural Ignatian Inquiry After School Symposium. Have a great day.